The year was 2005. You might recall that was the year Hurricane Katrina hit the United States, devastating New Orleans and the entire Gulf Coast, in fact. But that year was also notable for another reason. Anthony Morris III joined the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. Before that, he had served roughly 10 years as a circuit overseer with his wife, Susan. But who exactly is Anthony Morris? Where did he come from? What was his life like before becoming one of Jehovah's Witnesses? Today, we are going to find out. We're going to combine info from Watchtower articles about him, info from public records, and what he said in talks over the years to really appreciate more fully who Anthony Morris is. If you'd like to have them available, I'll be referencing in particular two Watchtower articles. One is the March 15, 2006 Watchtower, page 26, New Members of the Governing Body. This article has some good detail on Tony's theocratic career. And the second is the May 15, 2015 Watchtower, starting on page 3, Remembering My First Love Has Helped Me to Endure. This is Tony's autobiographical life story. Well, to begin with, Anthony Morris was born in 1950 in the state of Michigan, and it appears he lived there pretty much until he graduated high school. He graduated from Douglas MacArthur High School in Saginaw, Michigan. Now, the website classmates.com has a great collection of high school yearbooks that people can look through. And so, in the 1967 high school yearbook, under the camera shy section for juniors who missed getting their picture taken, you'll see the name T. Morris. In the 1968 yearbook, we find him listed in the seniors uh, under the name Tony Morris. And you'll recognize that this same photo is used in his life story. If you flip through the yearbook, you'll find him in one other photo as well. And that's because Tony was a varsity athlete on the basketball team. And here we see him number 20 in the front row. We also find that his team had kind of a rough season. They finished with a 4-12 record. This honestly has to be one of my favorite things I found, seeing Tony in his basketball uniform. And, I mean, I think he wears it well. He was in good shape at that point. The thing that really makes this picture extra funny is when you consider what he would have to say years later about clothes for young men. And the other one that uh, needs addressing is for these young fellas, because the older ones aren't doing much of it, thankfully. Uh, it's the metrosexual look. We've addressed that in the past. We've said things about it. But what's happened now is really caught on more. Now, the metrosexual, that's the, the tight suit jacket and the tight pants, uh, better known as tight pants. <laughs> and uh, they are tight, I mean tight, all the way down to the ankles. And that is not modest, brothers. No. It's not appropriate. It's not sound of mind. But like I've been telling uh, others, and, and this is a fact, the homosexuals that are designing these clothes, they like you in tight pants. That's who likes it. Now, the school actually still had his home address on file, and so we know this is the house Tony's family was living in when he went to high school. All right, we'll turn our attention now to Tony and the Vietnam War. This, for me, is probably the most interesting part of the story. The Vietnam War itself is fascinating, since it wasn't a straightforward good versus evil, America versus the Nazis narrative. There was this moral ambiguity to it. And that ambiguity was felt by the soldiers fighting in the war, and eventually by the American public in general. And it is so interesting to see how that moral conflict impacted this young guy that would eventually rise to be one of the men heading up a religion with 8 million followers, Jehovah's Witnesses. In July 1968, Tony joined up with the U.S. Army. 
He served for two years, which most likely means that he was drafted. If he had enlisted, that would have been four years of active duty. I was able to obtain his military records from the National Archives, and these records really help to flesh out the info that he's already shared in various talks and articles. So, looking at the first paper, we see the dates that he served, July 17th of 68 through June 25th, 1970. And just go ahead and pause the video if you want to look at any particular details on these documents. Now, he was discharged at the rank of Specialist 5. It says a transcript of his court-martial is, quote, not in file. And all that means is that he never was court-martialed. It doesn't mean that he was, but the records are missing. The next paper shows his awards and decorations. These are pretty much the standard decorations you'd accumulate as a soldier that went to Vietnam. There's nothing super wild like Purple Hearts or Medals of Honor. And that makes perfect sense since he was working in an operating room and not out on the front lines. The next paper outlines two specific courses he took before his deployment. Those were medical corpsman and operating room specialist. We'll get more information on both of these in a minute here. Now let's look at the last paper. In July, Tony did his basic training at Fort Knox, Kentucky. We see he was rated excellent, both in terms of conduct and efficiency. The last column says PCS, or permanent change of station, i.e. now he's transferring to a different location. In October, he starts his advanced individual training. In other words, this is the specific job he'd have in the Army. The second column labels it his duty MOS, or military occupational specialty. And so initially, this is 91A, medical corpsman. A corpsman is kind of similar to EMT basic on the civilian side. He'd be learning a lot of first aid, assessment, initial medical care for injuries. I was able to take the EMT B course myself a few years back and I'd recommend it to anyone. It really teaches you a lot of good stuff about how to handle different situations. So this training was at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. The base there is a very large military training center. It's known as the Home of Army Medicine and the Home of the Combat Medic. Tony is mentioned in one of his talks actually observing the Catholics there while he was stationed in San Antonio. They live in shameless luxury, and even in Texas, in San Antonio, I'll never forget, was in the military there. And on their knees, these people went like two blocks away, crawling on their knees to go up the steps of the church. And there he is, the rain all the way up. Sincere people now, we're not picking on them. And he's all glorious, and these are such poor people. Didn't have a thing. But what they did have, they were given to them. And they're living in their shameless luxury. After the corpsman training, he does his training for operating room specialist, the MOS 91D. As you can see, this job entails basically everything short of actually being in on the surgery. So prepping patients, prepping the right supplies, prepping the ORs, doing initial assessments and treatment of the patients there. No doubt a pretty busy job there in Vietnam. So he spends a month training in San Antonio, and then two more months at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. It looks like his training wraps up in May, and he spends a few weeks bouncing around a couple locations, including Fort Benning, Georgia, before shipping out overseas. What had to be difficult is that he is heading to Vietnam in June 69, at the same time that the general opinion in America was becoming that the war was a bad idea, and that all the soldiers should be brought home. On June 27th, Life magazine published its famous issue with photos of all 242 Americans that were killed in Vietnam the previous week. And this magazine, which it also included the, the Hamburger Hill casualties, really sparked a stronger shift in public opinion against the war. At the same time, a decline in morale among the soldiers in Vietnam was also growing. So there had to be a lot of mixed messages for Tony as he's heading off toward, uh, to Vietnam. He writes that, quote, 
Like all new arrivals, I was allowed one week of orientation so that I could adapt to the different time zone and the intense heat, unquote. In addition to the heat, many vets have also commented on this terrible rotting stench that would hit them when they'd arrive. They arrived at Long Bin Post. That was the largest army base in Vietnam. And so, as he says, a week later, he moves to the army base at Dong Tam in the Mekong Delta. The Army 9th Infantry Division was based at Dong Tam. Tony worked as a member of the 3rd Surgical Hospital in the 68th Medical Group. They were the ones providing the medical care for the 9th Infantry. Tony was stationed down there about seven weeks. He mentioned in one talk about being shelled by mortars when he was there at that base. I had been in bomb shelters when I was in Vietnam, uh, new, you know, young soldier. I did uh, operating room work there, but when I first got there, they were bombing, you know, after you got my orientation up around Long Bin, I went down into the Delta, was down there for some months, and they were bombing all the time. It was like the 4th of July, but it was real. Not a pleasant thing, you know, these wars. Well, anyway, uh, I was working 12-hour shifts, 7 at night to 7 in, uh, excuse me, 7 in the morning till 7 at night. Later, I'd switch and went to night one. So, I got tired. Even though I was young and I loved working, I loved medicine. Uh, and so, when I'd go to bed, I remember when I was first there, just my first few days there, they start bombing us, sending in these mortars. Mortars, get up, you know, because I mean... The, what do you mean, get up? I heard the bombs, too, dummy. You know? So get your helmet. So I had to get a helmet and a flak jacket and all this stuff to go down in the bunker, which was right there by where our barrack was there. I get in there, and it held about 20, as I recall. I wouldn't, it's not an exact science in the memory of that. But I'm looking around at all, and wearing their helmets and the flak jackets. And of course, mine was brand-new fatigues. Everybody knew I was brand-new. I'm looking at all of them. I said, hey, let me ask you a question. What? Because they're all nervous. I can tell they're nervous, and let me learn something here. I said, what happens if one of those mortars hits us directly? They said, I said, so this is a coffin. <laughs> so, and I don't recommend this, and I was young. I'm, I'm just telling you the experience. So from henceforth... I didn't get out of bed. And they'd say, you're nuts. I said, forget it. And I'm not going on the coffin. I said, I hope it doesn't hit you. And one night, a big chunk of shrapnel tore my locker up, by the way. I was so glad that hit the locker instead of me. So it, they could say it was foolish. I got used to it. I said, I got to get some sleep sometime. Now, Tony was only there maybe a month or two because President Nixon had approved starting troop withdrawals from Vietnam. In fact, the very first troop withdrawal of the war was 800 soldiers from the 9th Infantry on July 8th, just two days after Tony got to Dong Tam. Eventually, the entire 9th Infantry would rotate back to the U.S., and the base would be taken over by the South Vietnamese forces. So September 1st, he's reassigned to the 93rd Evacuation Hospital back at Long Bin Post. So when he talks about being shelled, we can assume he's talking about his time at Dong Tam because Long Bin was an extremely well-protected base. In fact, the final attack of any size there was in February of 69, about seven months before Tony arrived there. So, for the time period he was in Vietnam, if you had to be over there, Long Bin was pretty much the place to be. It was an enormous base. It covered an area the size of Cleveland. It was somewhat insulated from the war, and it had amazing amenities there. You can tell the military pretty much had a blank check when it came to spending money on this base. HistoryNet had a great article on the base titled, Easy Living in a Hard War behind the lines in Vietnam, and I'll link that article below. But it relates that perks on the base, among other things, included 81 basketball courts, two miniature golf courses, a driving range, 40 bars, an unofficial brothel, and a male beauty bar with salon services. 
So Tony was stationed here for his remaining eight months in Vietnam. Like everything else on the base, the medical facilities were quite extensive. Recall he was with the 93rd EVAC hospital, and the 24th and 21st EVAC hospitals were also stationed there. The medical teams there could do pretty much anything necessary. They handled the combat casualties, of course. They also did dentistry, OBGYN, you name it. By this time, drug abuse was also getting to be a major problem in the military, and drugs were easily available in Saigon, so that nearly half of all soldiers experimented with marijuana, opium, and heroin over there. Eventually, the military hospitals would be treating more drug cases than combat casualties. So Tony plugged away working on the base until the spring of 1970. He tells us that at that time, he contracted a serious infectious illness. Now that wasn't uncommon for soldiers in that tropical part of the world. And so as troop drawdowns continue, he is shipped back to the United States uh, he goes to Valley Forge General Hospital in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, which is outside Philadelphia. He arrives there April 20th. That's the same day Nixon announces another troop withdrawal of 150,000 soldiers over the next year. Thinking about it, I mean, it had to be just such a relief for Tony to be back on American soil again. Alive. Sure, he's sick, but he made it through his time in Vietnam. In May 4th, that was the day of the Kent State shooting, and then on June 25th at the hospital, he's discharged to the Army Reserves. Now, Tony's Vietnam service was clearly a seminal experience in his life, one that would impact him mentally, emotionally, and spiritually for really decades to come. At Dong Tam, he experienced the helplessness of being unable to do anything as mortars would rain down on the base. At Long Bin, it was a little different. He didn't face death personally each day, but probably pretty much every day saw him caring for combat soldiers that came back to the base with terrible injuries that needed immediate surgery. He writes, quote, After returning from Vietnam, I felt a need for God in my life. Painful memories had numbed me emotionally." Unquote. In a talk, he expanded on this idea of being really emotionally numb from what he'd seen. And now, it's just very, very concerning for me. You see, I was uh, in Vietnam, a medic in that war. Uh, I've seen what happens to humans when they're mangled. You see it on TV and some of that. Well, do you smell human flesh burning from a helicopter crash? People that look like uh, humans, like a hot dog on a grill, blackened and splitting open. Uh, I know what's coming in Armageddon. A lot of dead people. A lot of dead people. So it's absolutely urgent for us to get our minds off ourselves and let's get out there and help as many as we can because when it comes, it's going to be numbing for you. You think seeing a deer mangled on the side of the road from a truck that hit it is upsetting? You see humans like it. So it's going to be numbing. In talking with medical folks, whether nurses, doctors, paramedics, this disconnection from emotion and being able to unplug from what you're seeing is a common defense mechanism. You'll see them develop this macabre, black sense of humor, and it helps create this protective barrier from the terrible things that they have to deal with in their job. To outsiders, they may end up sounding jaded and even uncaring to other humans. Now, I don't want to underplay how really inappropriate it is to talk about humans being like hot dogs splitting open on the grill, especially when we consider that he, Tony's speaking to an audience here that undoubtedly contains many small children listening. He's clearly going for a bit of shock value to try and scare his audience straight, as it were. But at the same time, where the boundaries of appropriateness are for him have shifted due to his experiences in the war. 
Looking at it from another angle, he has clearly used his Vietnam experiences to inform his concept of what Armageddon will be like. To Tony, it seems like it will be a lot like the Vietnam War, but on a global scale. Jehovah's Witnesses have never taught that Armageddon would be anything like, uh, like Thanos in the Avengers movies, where the dead just fade away like dust in the wind. For witnesses, it's always been depicted as a violent, bloody destruction where people are really suffering as they die. Well, there was plenty of suffering in Vietnam that Tony could use as source material to imagine Armageddon. In one talk, he described the difficulty of returning back to civilian life from the military. And if you've ever been in the military, and I know some of you here personally that were, uh, I, I was in the war in Vietnam before I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. When Jehovah calls him a wild beast, because the enforcer for the governments is the military. Let me tell you, Jehovah describes them just like they are. Like animals. The way they can kill. And then they expect them to come back to this country and act normal. Can't act normal after you've seen all of that. That like a beast. Well, he isn't talking about himself specifically. It sounds like he knows very well the situation of returning and being expected to act normal, and yet you're unable to do that. He writes, It seemed that no one really understood what was going on in Vietnam. Unquote. Can we say that Tony has PTSD? I mean, I don't think anyone would be surprised at that or even blame him for that matter if it were true. Research I've seen estimates that 30% of Vietnam vets have had PTSD. And he does write some thoughts that may support that idea. Quote, in war, people do terrible things. I was no exception. Unquote. What does he mean by this statement? Tony returned stateside in 1970 when the outrage over the My Lai massacre was peaking. But considering his job in the operating room as opposed to combat, it's hard to picture what he would mean by having done terrible things. So perhaps he's just exaggerating it a little bit. There certainly could be a slight chance he actually did terrible things. Maybe a more likely possibility is survivor's guilt this unfounded guilt of making it through alive with all his limbs intact, while so many other young soldiers didn't do that. He describes pretty clearly having a flashback in his life story. At that point, he was working night shifts in a hospital emergency department in Florida. His parents had just kicked him out of the house. He's living in his car, and he talks about having a flashback behind the Kingdom Hall in Delray Beach. If there is some PTSD... That's pretty challenging as one of Jehovah's Witnesses because going to a therapist or a psychologist is pretty much frowned on by the organization. It's definitely not encouraged, I would say. It's also unlikely that, as a witness, he would be going to group therapy at a VA hospital where he could talk with other vets about their shared experiences. Now, when Tony returned from Vietnam in 70, 1970, these treatment options really didn't even exist at that point. The very term PTSD wasn't even coined until around 1980. So one method many vets found of coping was self-medicating with alcohol, with heavy drinking. A study done in 1975, so just after the war ended, found that 36% of the vets studied demonstrated either alcoholism or serious alcohol-related problems that could develop into alcoholism. And it's understandable, alcohol on the surface would seem like it would help you cope with things. But in a really interesting article, it was originally published in 1984, notice this passage by the authors, Thomas Brinson and Vince Trainer. Quote, In addition to becoming a problem in and of itself, La Courcier et al. also observed that abusive use of alcohol significantly exacerbates the symptoms of PTSD. For example, as a depressant, alcohol may contribute to psychic or emotional numbing and induce depression. 
While in a depressed stage, a pattern of heavy drinking may lead to obsessive ruminations about combat experiences, intensifying survivor guilt. Self-destructive actions may follow. Unquote. I'll put a link to this article in the description, but what really jumped out at me is the similarity of what it says to what Tony wrote about his feelings there in 1971. Recall he wrote, Painful memories had numbed me emotionally. It seemed that no one really understood what was going on in Vietnam. Unquote. Now, of course, from this vantage point, it's impossible to say whether he has used heavy drinking to self-medicate. Oddly enough, though, this would be one avenue available to him as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. If done inconspicuously, even heavy alcohol use is basically tolerated in the organization. Fortunately, though, today there is much more attention, many more treatment options for both PTSD and alcohol abuse among Vietnam veterans. He evidently reached at least some sort of closure. He writes that, quote, Jehovah has forgiven me for what I have done, unquote. Now, I'm no psychologist, but it is so interesting to me to look at Jehovah's Witnesses through the lens of the Vietnam War. On the one hand, there seems to be a sort of unspoken feeling of superiority among witnesses for their refusal to engage in the world's affairs, because in that way they avoid any guilt for its wars, for its atrocities. None of the soldiers that participated in the My Lai Massacre were witnesses, because no witnesses were in the military. And witnesses feel good. They feel proud about that aspect. However, at the same time, I think there's guilt that exists for not doing anything to stop the wars and atrocities. Witnesses could receive no credit for helping to end the Vietnam War. There were no witnesses at, Viet at anti-war protests. None of them would have voted for Nixon as he campaigned on his platform of ending the war. They were more like passive spectators at a tennis match, just watching the ball go back and forth. They couldn't accept any shame for their share in the nation's wrongs, and yet they also had no contentment for having tried to correct matters. And so I wonder if this unease internally about their silence, about their inaction, is perhaps why so many witnesses threw them into the preaching work in that time period. Now obviously the 1975 teaching helped with that. But as we'll see in a little bit, in a few months, Tony went from having never set foot in a kingdom hall to spending a hundred hours a month preaching its message. Many other folks did the same at that time. So I have to wonder, was all this busyness an attempt to avoid having to think about all the thorny moral issues the Vietnam War had raised? It's hard to say. I'll link to a great article by Peter Marin published in 1981 titled Living in Moral Pain, and it does a nice job delving deeper into these issues. Well, I think that wraps up our look at Tony's life up through the Vietnam era. In the next video, we'll look at who his parents were. Is he really Anthony Morris III? Stay tuned. Until then, thanks for watching. Take care.